glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus. Uh, before we get started, I want to say, um, uh, I want to celebrate my brother, my friend, um, Dr. Tim Godfrey. Um, he's with us tonight. <laughs> Is the is the is the bishop of many bishops? Uh, it's deep. <laughs> I'm I'm always happy when I see him. You know, um, so much has happened over the past few months, and it's it's always good to have people that you can call at any time, and you know they 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 reason with you. You know, so it's somebody that um, the Lord has sent into my life, especially for this time. So we thank God for him, not just for that, but he has one of the biggest songs right now in the world. Big God. So, so we also acknowledge that God in you. Uh, it says it said he has something for great grace. So yeah, he has something he cooked up for me. That's going to give me later. So thank you in advance. <laughs> Somebody grab your Bibles. <laughs> mm. I listen, this man is deep. Somebody say Prr. <laughs> that's specially for him. For the prophecy he will give later. <laughs> it's deep. <laughs> grab your Bibles quickly. Go to the book of Revelation. I love this scripture very much. I love this scripture very much. You've probably heard me read it before. One thing I love about the scriptures is that you might look at it today and get a revelation for, for your today's walk, for your today's need. But you can also look at the same scripture tomorrow and get something totally different that is relevant for your tomorrow. And in six years, you can look at the exact same scripture and it will still be relevant. This scripture is the only book in history that never expires in relevance. In every era, it is still relevant. Somebody say, I am relevant. I am relevant. Because I carry the word of God in me. When you have the word of God in you, you never go out of style. Amen. Let's see, let's say, say, I can never go out of style. I can never go out of style. And somebody look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. Uh, you always got sauce. Uh, <laughs> if your neighbor is over 40, say neighbor. neighbor. Uh, the Lord Jesus dwells in you. <laughs> and if you are a single man sitting beside a single sister, you've made a big mistake. <laughs> you were looking to, planning on talking to her after church. And you just looked at her to tell her it is well. Remember, marriage is not, is not a prize. It's not a prize. Somebody say marriage is not a prize. Not a prize. Marry at your own time. Don't rush marriage. I'm, I'm, I'm now 50 years old. There's no marriage. It's, don't rush marriage. Your Prince Charming might be there at 51. I'm telling you. Remember that Prince Charming is not based on is not based on time. Uh, it's based on okay. We'll preach on that later. This is not Disney Church. <laughs> uh, somebody say what a, what a good God. And your past situation does not determine whether you get a good man or a bad man. Look at the story of Ruth and Naomi. She had married. The husband died. They said this one was married before. She carries bad luck with her. Only for God to change her story. <laughs> Somebody say, he's changing my story. He's changing my story. Right now, some people might not want to affiliate with you because they think that you will bring baggage with you. you say, I have two kids. Who's going to look at me? Can I tell you this? It's only baggage to somebody who's lazy. You see, some of you don't realize that you're expensive, that your baggage is expensive. It's designer. It's MS. All right. it, it only gets more expensive in time. 
You don't know what I'm talking about. Don't let nobody talk down on you and make you feel like, you know, you, your time has passed. Who gets to dictate the appointed time when you have Jesus? Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. Actually, let's read from verse 9. Let's read from verse 8. Let's read from verse 7. <laughs> from verse 7, and we're going to go all the way to verse 11. Okay, let's read together. And there was war in heaven... Somebody say, I've overcome. I've overcome. You may be seated in heavenly places. We have all the babies with us today, so you might be hearing, ah, whoa, ah. It's okay. It's fine. You're welcome. Like that. <laughs> it's okay. Imagine you're at home right now watching the live stream on the TV and your child is crying. It's okay. It's fine. Let them cry today. It's okay. God is good. Can I tell you this? Let me present a case to you. Let me present a case that whenever it is that it seems like the enemy has brought all his forces to attack you. You know when you go through things today, tomorrow, next tomorrow, and on the third day you go through nine things at one time. And you know it's a product of demonic attacks and satanic manipulations. You ever been through those things before? Those days? Crazy days, right? Crazy times. Let me break it to you that it's because Satan, in that particular season in your life, he has a short time to operate. And because he knows he has a short time to operate, he brings all of his arsenal. And watch this. He's not angry because of the short time. He's angry because he's been defeated once already. And he's afraid that you're going to find out that he was defeated the first time. So if he can... Turn your focus from the fact that he's been defeated. Then already you're in danger. So when he's doing all these little stupid things, it's just to make you lose focus. Someone say, I'm not going to lose focus. Notice this. There was a time he was in heaven and his work in heaven, his job in heaven was to accuse people. But interestingly enough, he was kicked out of heaven and he wasn't kicked into hell. Every realm that you live in and every realm that was created has a government and a jurisdiction. It has a legal system. So in the legal system in heaven, he no longer could have accused the brethren there. But here is a small problem. Right now, I'm talking to you. You're in Miami. You're on earth. You're seated right here. And when you leave this place, you're going to go into the real world. And you're going to have real life challenges. And some days, clap your hands, shout for joy is not going to work. Some days the kingdom is going to have to, uh, or the violent are going to have to take it by force. Every day is different. You attack the day based on what God has for the day, not, what based, on, not based on what the day brings. There are people that attack the day based on what the day brings. You have lost focus already. 
I don't respond to the day. I respond to God. And I speak the word of God into the day. I, 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 are you capturing me? So Satan was cast into the government of the earth. And when he was cast into the government of the earth, his job was to accuse. Meaning that there must be punishment for every sin that is committed here on earth. Any mistake that is committed, any, however you want to paint it, and you know sometimes they say, it's not sin, it's just a mistake, you know. However you want to approach it, whatever English you want to use, whatever Spanish, senor, however you want to attack it, Creole, I don't know how you say it in that, but it's thin, you know. His job until the end of age is to stand and point every single thing that you do that is off back to the Father and say, look what this person did. You have to, you have to get them for their actions. And interestingly enough, he doesn't lie about what you've done. It truly is what you've done. The lie is not in him making things up about you. The lie is in him trying to pervert what God has already established. God made a provision for somebody to take on the things that he's pointing, <laughs> that he's trying to highlight about you. Somebody said there is a game plan for me. Let me explain this to you. I said something on Sunday. I said something on Sunday, and I said that. How is it that Jesus came to the, the disciples on the road to Emmaus, and they didn't see the scars on his hands? Let me explain this to you. You have to understand that whenever you enter into the place where God will move for you, the first person that shows up is not angels of God. is the accuser of the brethren. This is why the beginning of everything is always difficult. When God tells you start this business, it's usually not like, wow, everything just came together. No, there were challenges at first, then everything came together. It's because there is somebody that has been sent to accuse you. If somebody has been sent to accuse you, then you have to be careful that he doesn't use agents around you. And his agents are usually not enemies. They are usually friends. They're usually friends you used to know. Who knew about your past? Who knew about that secret that nobody else knows about? Only you and Jesus. Amen. And sometimes your diary if you, if you journal. Okay, I saw somebody laugh. Yeah, people journal. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a way to... It's therapeutic for some people. You know, it's, it's, you, write, you write down things. Some people even write down their prayers. But watch this. You have to understand that if there is an accuser... You see, somebody said this to me. They say, why don't you open up to the fathers and why don't you come out and why don't you speak this and say this and blah, blah, blah. And I said, the problem is not that some of us don't want to be vulnerable. The problem is that the fathers have failed us. You give them a small thing that's happened in your life. They'll come out to the altar and say, God said, thus says the Lord. No, I told you this. I was the one that told you my problem and now you're preaching about my problem. So now I don't feel safe anymore coming to tell you my problem. I would rather deal with my problem by myself and with my Jesus. And sometimes you see people that hide things to themselves and you wonder why they don't speak or share things with other people. The last time that they did, they got into big trouble. Why would they share again? You see, you have to understand, you have to know whom to show your scars to. Jesus, there was a reason why he didn't show those two disciples his scars. But when he came to where Thomas was, he says, look at my scars. Same Jesus, same person, same experience, same revelation, but only some people got to see the scars. Remember this, your scars are literally your ranking in the spirit. When people talk about spiritual ranking, they say, oh, you know, if you pray for 40 days, your rank will increase. We're praying for 100 days. I hate to break it to you. After 100 days of prayer, your rank will still be the same. Ranking is not about how well you fast. There are people that have never fasted that have asked God for the thing that you've been praying for nine years and God heard them. Why did he hear them? True spiritual rank is not about your fasting. Am I telling you not to fast? I can't tell you not to fast because I'm in a hundred day fast right now. In fact, some of you are also fasting the fast with me. So I'm not speaking against fasting. I'm not definitely not speaking against prayer. Hear me and hear me carefully. 
I'm telling you that spiritual ranking is seen based on the scars you carry. But not everybody has the privilege to know your identity spiritually. Meaning that I don't have to inform you what I've been through. You just have to see when I get to the end. You don't have to understand my process. You don't have to understand anything at all. Can I tell you your problem? Somebody say, help us, Jesus. Let me tell you the problem of many believers. And this is where many people, this is where many, many people get it wrong. You confuse what destiny truly is. You really confuse what destiny is. When you think about destiny, you know, you think, you know, yes, destiny is a destination. It's somewhere that the Lord is going to bring you into. It's the future of your life. It's your, for some of you, it's your wives. It's some of you, it's your husband. You know, those of you that are single that are believing God for your, for your David. Well, I don't know if you want a David because um, he was a little crazy, you know. Believing God for your boys. Uh huh. I'm just waiting for Prophet. I'm just waiting for my boys. And 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 the sons are waiting for who? Ruth. Okay. They're waiting for your Ruth. Do you know Ruth came to Boaz? But that's it's not marriage class today. <laughs> so you confuse destiny for blessings, and destiny and blessings are two different things. Matter of fact, you get blessed more and most in the process, on the journey, not at the destination. The problem is this, that many of you confuse history for destiny. So you have people in your life whom the common denominator is not destiny, but history. And here is the big thing that you need to understand. God does not bring you forward based on history. He brings you forward based on destiny. And there are some people that you have made covenants with based on history. And because of that, it's stopping you from destiny. Destiny is not emotional. It's not based on how long I've known you for. Destiny is not the things we've done together. It's what would we do in the future. Do you align? Do you fit with the future? And if we're going to deal with destiny, then we must deal with the scars. But the scars are not there as a reminder. The scars are there to show an identity. It's there to show for access in the future. Your scars are to show Satan, listen, I defeated you before when I had nothing. When I was at zero, I defeated you. Now I got a little something going on. If you dare raise your ugly head, just the same way I defeated you. I defeated you six years ago. I'm going to... Seems like you forgot. You know, sometimes some people forget too soon. He, you know, Satan wishes that you forgot that he's defeated already. Nah, I don't know if somebody's here. Are, are, you, are you still here? So the con common denominator cannot be history. Our common denominator has to be destiny. Where are you headed do you fit in my future? Do you fit in the plan that God has for me? Do I fit in the plan that God has for you? Because destiny has to be mutually beneficial. There are people right now in your lives, and, and I'm, I'm not saying this to be funny, but they have a parasitic relationship with you. It means they eat at your flesh. And the little you have, they... They, they take from you and they, 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 when they're done, they, they abuse you, then they beat you, and then they smash you up and they crush you, and then they go out and complain the one day that you don't give them. The one day, the one day you, you're tired and you say no. It's like, can, can you believe what they did to me? Par parasitic. You see, you have to pray that God delivers you from parasitic relationships. And you have to be discerning enough to understand the true difference between symbiosis, a symbiotic relationship, and a parasitic relationship. 
the number one or the first way to find whether you're in a parasitic relationship is even you, you will ask yourself, what do I do for you? Because you only get what you give out. So if all you're thinking is what can this person do for me, better understand you're also attracting parasites. God will never give you a tribe that is not after your kind. So if your brain is monkey brain, you're going to have monkey friends. And all of your business is going to be monkey business. <laughs> Say, Lord, why don't I have millions? Well, monkeys don't know what to do with millions. They just know how to jump from tree to tree. Zero loyalty. Zero faithfulness. Or oh, this is where it's cool at today. Or oh, we're here today. Oh, you're no longer cool. You don't do nothing for me anymore. I'm out. Ah. Jump into the next tree swinging their tails. Somebody say, oh, I ain't about no monkey business. <laughs> Tap three people say, no monkey business here. Tap another person say, no funny business here. <laughs> uh, you have to understand this. When the Lord will start bringing you towards destiny, the first problem that you encounter is the accuser of the brethren, number one. And his job is literally to tie you in whom you used to be and what you used to be and how you used to be what you used to be. Meaning he will cause for your function and your operation in God to remain the same, though you are at a new level and, in, and it, at a new height. It's like being in, is there 11th grade? It's like being in 11th grade in, in where I'm from. We call it primary school, primary one, primary five, six, whatever. So you're, you're in 11th grade, but you're still doing, what's that, that math that they do with the, no, the one that the kids do, they put some things in them. They take a little box, square. They put it, take another square, cubes. You know this toy mats. So imagine right now, like I walk into your house and I see you in the living room with some toys like, ah, welcome, Papa, welcome. <laughs> and on the floor, you know, you have your bottle of milk, you drink a little bit. Okay, let's not use you as an example. Use your neighbor as an example. Imagine you walked into a house and she has a bottle of milk. And she's crying like that. Ah, and she has pacifier on. You'll be the first to call church. Ah, prophet, when is the next deliverance service? There is somebody that seriously needs, there are, this is an endangered species. They need deliverance today. But that's what the enemy does. He, he, you, you, you're moving on in life. He lets you move on in life. But he keeps accusing you based on who you were yesterday. So, the word for accuser means a public prosecutor. It means they work in the government. They're not going anywhere. So then, you know, I was asked this question yesterday, and I thought it was very, very interesting because it was part of what I was going to speak about today. And the question was, so who is the accuser of the brethren? And remember that the accuser of the brethren, if he is a public prosecutor, that means he has to, or his role in the government is very vital in order for things to run smoothly. Now, what he does is that he looks for what you've done that doesn't align with the will of God, the plan of God, the mind of God, and he takes you and he takes that thing and he tells God to look at it and punish you. Hey, somebody, somebody, tap your neighbor, say, are, are you still here, neighbor? Maybe tap the other neighbor, say, neighbor, are you still here? Tap three people, say, are you still here? Wake them up, say, are you still here? Somebody, baby is out there shouting, are you still here? <laughs> so now, what God does, because he knows that every government must have a public prosecutor. What he does was this, or what he did was this. God looked at the earth 
And he says, if I leave things the way they are right now, there will be a big problem. Every single person will die and they will be doomed forever. So the only thing I can do is I have to send down another prosecutor. This is why the scripture says that you have an attorney that stands before the father and intercedes on your case that talks to the father about your matter. What does this mean? It means that there, there was a replacement and displacement of the former prosecutor. This last prosecutor was telling the father everything you did wrong. This one, this scripture says, for this attorney speaks good things. He speaks what is right. He doesn't look at your mistakes. He looks at, let me explain it to you how God has done it. If you sin, God must look away from you. The Bible says your sin disconnected you from the father. So wherever there is sin, he must look away from you. It is bound by his word to do so to you. He is a God that created the word. He, you, you, didn't, you can't take the word out of him. You can't separate it, it from him. Yes. Yet he still sends the word. But there is no separation. It's a mystery that only God can explain. We don't have an explanation to it. And it's okay that we don't. Because the moment we have an explanation for everything, we become God. Don't let, the, don't let the temptation of seeking knowledge and finding out answers bring you far away from God. Sometimes you have to hear, I don't know. And it's okay to not know. You see, you see the perversion of Satan is this. The word of God is the standard for your life. But the perversion of Satan will take your life. And use the word of God to justify whatever you do. So you say, well, I did this. I'm, I'm not going to take accountability for it. Instead, I'm going to say that the scripture says this in this place. And it's, a, it's a perversion. It's like reverse. Somebody say, it, it, it's, a no it's a no for perversion. So capture this. So whenever God looks at sin, he has to punish sin. So Jesus now goes on the cross and becomes sin. He becomes sin. And when he becomes sin for the first time, God, God used to tell Jesus things. He would say, this is what I'm doing. Jesus would look and say, that's what you're really doing. Then Jesus would do what he's seen the Father do. He would speak what the Father is speaking. He knew the secrets of the hearts because he had the mind of the Father. He had the consciousness of the Father. But a time came that he became sin, and because God is bound by his word, God had to look away. So Jesus is on the cross saying, my God, my God. Notice he didn't say my father. Because sin had separated him from relationship. So he couldn't look, at, he couldn't look and say my father, my father. He had to say my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? He was disconnected from the source. The word of Christ was showing what was actually happening spiritually. I can tell your relationship with God by how you pray. There's some people that say, oh God in heaven, oh God the giver. Oh God the provider, oh God. But there's some of us that say, my father. Yes, Lord. And my father is not about daily bread. It means even if I don't see daily bread, you're still father. My relationship with you is deals with blood, not deals with provision. If your relationship with him is based on provision, then he's not your father. Satan's relationship with him is not based on blood. You have to remember this. Every relationship based on blood is the only thing or is what is stronger than any other relationship. So... The person that gave birth to you, even if you say that person is not your father, he's always going to be your father. Because DNA. Somebody say DNA. DNA. Remember this. What is speaking and what is accusing is blood. So many of you think that Jesus goes and stands before God and begins to say, oh God, they did this and they did this. No. He's seated at the right hand of God. But when he came to earth and he was crucified, his blood went into the ground. Before there was the accuser. And the accuser spoke to Cain. 
then Cain killed his brother. But if you understand that not just the, not the spirit of man speaks, but the blood of man speaks, then it makes sense why the scripture is saying the blood of Abel cried out. And the blood of Abel accused his brother before the father and says, hey, he killed his brother. Then God says, where is your brother? What spoke and cried out from the ground? Not Satan, but the blood of, Cain, of Abel. Notice this. The scripture now says, for the blood of Jesus speaks better things than the blood of Abel. So what is speaking before the father is the blood. What is saying, what is saying this one? Don't, don't look at this one. What is covering you before the father is the blood of Jesus. That's what has the, what has the voice. Watch this and capture this. So, there have been different prosecutors and different attorneys that will speak. But in order for you to enter into where God has for you, to enter into destiny, there has to be one voice that is speaking for you. Not even your blood can speak for you and the Father will listen to it. So, Jesus is on the cross now, separated from the Father, saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He dies when he dies, the punishment of sin that was placed on him dies with him. The sting of death dies with him. The, the final punishment, the total totality of punishment dies with him. When he comes back, he's no longer saying, I need to go to God and present myself. He tells the woman, I need to go to the Father and present myself. Notice now he's not saying my God, he's now saying my Father. It's the same language he was using when he was teaching them to pray. Say, my father. So now Jesus looks at the disciples and says unto them, You, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Yet some of you or everybody was born into sin. How then is he saying, I will never leave you nor forsake you if you were born into sin? That means the only people that he leaves or people that are not connected with him are people that are still stuck in the past of sin. That still allow for their blood, their works to speak for them. Remember your blood is your works. It's that thing that you believe makes you saved. Oh, I, I read my Bible 247. You think that's why you're saved? Oh, you know, I, I pray in the morning. I give to the poor. You know, you know you can actually give to the poor and that will not be what God wants you to do. Some people say, you know, I give my tithes to the poor. The scripture says, bring in your tithes and offering into the storehouse, not to the hands of the poor. So you, you're thinking you're spiritual and you're holy. Oh, I'm so holy because I do this. Maybe in another religion. But in this one, if, you, if it's this word, then... Uh, you. Hey, are you following me? So now, the blood of Abel or the human blood is no longer speaking on your behalf. But here is the problem. Anytime you come in the spirit before the father, the accuser is still looking for ways to say, ah, this one is Jake. This one is Abel. This one is Julia. This one is uh, uh, Sean. This one is Raquel. So the accuser is telling the father your database based on whom you used to be before the adoption. Remember this, that we are adopted sons. Adam was a created son. Jesus was the only begotten son. And we are adopted into the family of God. But what the enemy does is that he goes before God and begins to speak about your old family. And he comes to you and he doesn't tell you, hey, you've been adopted. He tells you, ah, you're still broke. God just bless you. Don't pay your offering. You might lose it. In the adoption of God, in the family, he says, I will supply all your needs according to my riches in glory. Watch this. But if you're still thinking as one that has not been adopted, you think you're going to lose everything. You won't carry yourself like somebody that has... So watch this. Jesus understood the assignment. He understood that 
after I die and I resurrect, there will come a time where the enemy will come to speak to these ones. Jesus told the disciples, he told the disciples of John, the Pharisees, when they say, why don't your disciples fast? He says, a time will come when the groom is with them, the master is with them. It's a time of rejoicing. A time will come when they will do those things. Somebody say, a time will come. A time will come. So watch this. The issue now is not that the enemy is trying to afflict your family. It's simply just not telling you what is available. And it's not his job to tell you what God has done for you. It's, it's not. You keep expecting the truth from people that were never spoken to by God. You keep expecting people to align with your vision when God himself didn't show them your vision. You keep, the, you keep expecting people that he has never spoken to one day to understand why you worship the way you worship. Why you trust him the way you trust him. Oh, you know, I can't believe you made a comment about my, my faith online. It kind of hurt me a little bit. Well, you, it's okay. You can make comments because you don't understand. If you understood, you would... <laughs> So capture this. So what was the provision of Jesus that he kept before he left? Here was the provision. Before when you go before the Father, you have to mention a name to the Father. God doesn't respond to cry. He responds to names. God doesn't show up for a person. He shows up for a name. God doesn't crown a person. He crowns a name. This is why you have to understand that he gave him a name and he crowned him. The him there is the character, the anoma, the name. That at the name, not at the, at the person, at the name. Where the power is, in, is not in the person, is in the name. This is why sometimes you enter into situations, you try to, you know, cast out some, some demons, they don't listen to you. Because you're still entering into those situations by yourself. You're still going with your old name. You got a little problem, you know, Satan, I come against thee. And you use King James English in your prayer. And even Satan is responding back to you in King James. Thou shalt not come against me. <laughs> you give him King James version. He gave you NIV. And even amplify to it, describe it even more to you. It's like Pharaoh, you know, Pharaoh, the, the, Moses came and Moses says, you know, let my people go. Pharaoh said, I will not. And he says, hey, turn up the problems. Make it harder for them. Notice the time is getting harder. It's right when you're about to come out. And Pharaoh's time was short and Pharaoh wanted to distract them from understanding and knowing that the delivery was already at hand so they had Moses the deliverer but all they could think about was what Pharaoh was doing this is why at some point they took up stones to stone Moses they were not seeing the deliverer they were seeing the affliction somebody said I'm not looking at the affliction many are the afflictions of the righteous however Listen, I, 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 I don't care how much the affliction is. I don't care how painful it is. Somebody say, say keep your eyes on him. Eyes. So watch this. The moment that you come before God with your old name, what happens is this. He turns away. He looks another direction because that name is connected to sin. When that database is pulled up, they see all your files. Ah, this one. Addiction. This one told me that he will come to church every single day. He skipped four services so far. He told me if I give him that car, he will serve me. But he has taken four women this week alone on dates. Promised four women marriage. <laughs> not, 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 not sons here. You don't do that. So this one. You said if I bless your business, you will give unto me bountifully and recklessly. So you've been giving carefully. So, 
He told me, okay, let me not go there because I might offend somebody. Somebody say, I am not offended. Not offended. Another person say, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. <laughs> so Jesus goes, dies, you know, and he dies and, and, and he's come back and he's leaving the disciples and he knows that there is power attached to his name. There is salvation attached to his name. There is a new, the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is what? But if you're in Christ, if you were in the name. So he says, when you go before the Father now, if you will ask anything in my name, he's saying, don't come before the Father and say, Lord, is Jared here again? Come and say, Father, it's Jesus here. <laughs> so that when he looks, he's like, oh, you're the one in whom I'm well pleased. He's no longer seen you before adoption. He's now seen whom Christ is and the fullness of his son. So whenever you ask, he says, if you ask anything in my name, it will be given unto you. Why? Because the father is bound to do everything for the son. The Bible says, and they looked and there was no man found worthy to open the book. No man. But the lamb that was slain was found worthy. And he says, the four and twenty elders cast their crowns. Where was the crowns? The crowns were on their names. They took the crowns off of their names and said, no, we, 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 we can't take this. There is nothing we can ever do that the Father will accept if we keep our crowns. We have to take on the crown of another person. So God looks at you, and when he wants to deal with you, he's telling you, listen, just put your old nature behind. What is your old nature? Before they called me Brianna, now my name is Christ. When I enter into dark places, the enemy is not seeing EJ. When I walk into dark places, he's seeing Jesus. The Bible says, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. So if I walk into a situation that has been standing for many years in my family, and many people have tried to cast out this problem, but the problem never stopped. Many people have tried to change this behavior, but it never changed. And I walk in in the name of Jesus. Every problem, it doesn't matter how long it has been there for. It bows to the name that is above every other name. There is somebody in this room right now who is taking off the old name, is entering into the new name, and at the name of... Somebody lift your hands five times and say, Jesus. Call on his name. Jesus. High five your name and say, neighbor, I got a new name. Say, I have a new identity. I have a new identity. Say, take a good look at me. Take a good look at me. It is no longer I that lives. It is no longer I that but lives. Christ but Christ lives in me. Lives in me. And I, and I dwell in him. Dwell in him. Take a good look at Jesus. Take a good look at Jesus. Look at the finished work of Jesus. Look at the finished work of Jesus. Can I tell you this? For some people, they think God is still working on them. But when you take on the name, you become the finished product. Yeah. Somebody say, I am the finished product. I am the finished product. Somebody lift your voice and give Jesus. Hey.